safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. In 1994, David Koenig authored the book Mouse Tales, the first unauthorized account of the history and culture of Disneyland. With it, he ignited a whole generation of fans, including me, who were just as curious as he was about what was happening behind the scenes at the happiest place on earth. From there, David has written several books on different aspects of Disneyland, one on Disney animation, and another on Disney World, all parting the curtain in ways Disney would never do themselves. David sits down with me to talk about Disney's official reaction to Mouse Tales, his newest book on Disneyland's original 1955 cast members, and that time former president of the Walt Disney Company, Card Walker, called him up on the phone. All that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. David Koenig, welcome to DreamFinders. Thank you so much for having me, Nathan. So you've written a number of books on Disney parks and people's experiences with them. But before we get there, I want to talk about your experiences a little bit. I'm curious about your upbringing and like your first Disney experiences. What were those? I was born in Chicago. We moved to Orange County when I was three. But the first time I actually visited Disneyland, I was about six. It would have been the summer of 1969. And uh, it was uh, an ex- exciting thing, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a life altering thing. It was as I grew up and got to know of Disneyland as this incredible resort vacation place that was just down the street. That it really, as my my childhood progressed and into my teen years, where it really started making an impression on me. And, and through my childhood, we'd go once every few years. But I, I unfortunately didn't get to go every year. That would have been neat. <laughs> but growing up in Orange County, as you said, you weren't that far uh, at that time. What was the environment like uh, living in uh, the county at that time? Were, were you know, was it uh, sort of just sort of in the distance? Everyone sort of knew about it, um, and and you know, you knew people who worked there, or was it sort of like this literally kind of mystical kingdom that wasn't really a part of your everyday existence? It was a mix of both of what you just said. It was certainly everybody knew about Disneyland, but it was a much more special place and less familiar in the sense that people didn't go there every day or or every week yeah. as so many annual pass holders do now. There was not the the familiarity with it. It was a place that people, uh, local folks, um, like myself, would go to, for the most part, once a year or once every few years. It was a big event. It was a special thing to do. Now, so many people in Southern California treat it as if it's the local mall. It's a <laughs> biannual passes, and it's Saturday night, so let's go to Disneyland, and we'll ride Space Mountain for the 40th time, and we'll walk around, and you know, and two hours, three hours later, after we've eaten, uh, Charles will leave. You know, back then it was a, a massive all-day experience um, that was just an incredible treat. You discussed in your first book a, a unique observation about adventure through inner space that sort of broke the Disney magic uh, for you at the round of age 10. Uh, could you kind of give us a little bit of background on that story? Yeah, well, that was uh, probably my second or third trip to Disneyland, and it would have been in the early 70s, and we were uh, visiting uh, venture through inner space, which is located or was located where Star Wars is today, and it had um, you were supposed to be shrinking into a very small size, and there was sort of like a, a a tube in which your miniaturized vehicle would pass through the uh, lobby, sort of, and, and and you'd see the people go in and they'd sit in a car and then they you know disappear into this contraption and then the next you'd see them passing through this this clear tube and they were very very small and it was as the first time i noticed that as a child it was oh, oh my gosh this is incredible that's uh, i'm a little nervous <laughs> i hope they bring me back to proper size but the second time i went um i looked a little closer and noticed that 
because it was, uh, you know, little, it was fake. <laughs> they were just miniatures. This wasn't actual people. They weren't moving. They were just little, you know, little dummies, little toy soldier size people. And that Disneyland was tricking us <laughs> and that we weren't actually getting shrunk. And as a 10 or 11 year old, it was, it was not uh, earth shattering. It was not like discovering the truth of Santa Claus or anything like that, <laughs> but it was sort of a light went off that, oh, those rascals, you know, what a, what a clever magic trick. At, at the same time as a kid, I was sort of into doing magic tricks as, as well. So it was like, oh, this whole place. And, and then it made me see Disneyland, even as a, as a preteen, a little bit different than getting caught up into the, you know, thinking I'm a cowboy or, you know, whatever the, the theme would be, you know, I was always sort of looking <laughs> okay, what's behind that door? Why did they do that that way? You know, sort of second level thinking uh, for a little kid. Uh, You yourself, though, were never a cast member. Why was that? I always thought it looked like fun uh, for most people, but for for the ones who it, it seemed to be most enjoying it were the Jungle Cruise skippers. And those were the ones I was always envious and thought, oh, if I ever went to Disneyland, this is what I want to do because... They don't have to play by the rules. Yeah, they <laughs> they have to wear a costume, but you know if they don't feel like smiling, if they want to put on the the facade of of being sullen or silly or whatever the personality they want to take on is for their act, that's fine. And they can sort of uh, say it seemed as if they could say whatever they wanted, whatever the top of their heads was certainly they couldn't say whatever they wanted but it, they gave that impression and i thought that if i ever did it that would be neat but then I, I started going to college at cal state fullerton which is located about 10 minutes away from disneyland it had the nickname cal state disneyland because <laughs> it, it was such a common place for uh, cal state fullerton students to work and i knew dozens of people who were cast members at disneyland and they would share their stories with me. Oh, you will never believe what happened at work last night um, or the grad night that we had to work and uh, or the crazy guests <laughs> that we ran into. And these stories were just wonderful to hear. Um, but then something really odd happened in my last semester at Cal State Fullerton, right before graduating in the fall of 1984, all my friends went out on strike hmm. against Disneyland. They were upset that the park was changing and that it was no longer feeling like it was a family anymore. Um, and they wanted to sort of fight to, to bring it back to what it used to be and figured at first Disneyland at its heart loved them and would never let them strike. So none of them ever thought it would get that far. And then when they first went out there on strike, it was the happiest strike on earth. And it was a big party and, uh, you know, they'd bring donuts and uh, L.A. Times would throw papers to the picket line. And it was just this, this raucous atmosphere, uh, music playing and having a good time and posing for uh, for photos in the paper. And then after a couple of days, you know, it wasn't so much fun anymore. <laughs> and after 22 days, they they finally uh, went back to work with uh, without getting quite what they'd they'd asked. For. And so many people viewed that as sort of the time when working at Disneyland changed. And it also uh, convinced me, well, maybe I don't ever want to work at Disneyland because I don't want to view it as a job. I want to view it as as this happy, fun place that I grew up with. Mm. Then after I had the idea to start writing about it for a living, it just didn't seem right for me to to work for Disneyland, um, to be pretending (laughs) that I wanted to to be there for the company and there for the guests and really just be there to, you know, spy on the happening or <laughs> to gain fodder for books. So it didn't morally seem right for me to work at, at, at that point. And, uh, and it, it's probably for best. Well, you bring up your books, of course, and you end up writing after you mentioned 84, 10 years after that, you publish your first book uh, about the park's mouse tales, a behind the ears look at Disneyland. And then in 99, you have a sequel, More Mouse Tales. So you started writing that first book in 88. What void in, in Disney's written history were you trying to fill? Was it that strike that first sort of sparked your interest of like, maybe there are stories that, you know, the official Disney company canon aren't, aren't going to tell? <laughs> 
Oh, absolutely. That's it, it exactly. And, and the strike was the thing that that most catalyzed in my mind. Boy, this is a side of Disneyland and nobody ever sees. And and up until that point, up through the eighties, um, no one had ever really written or published a book about Disneyland ever, except for the Disney Company. Everything out and what little there was were just company provided sugar coated histories. There was uh, the souvenir books that were typically written by Marty Sklar um, about this ride opening this year and oh, what fun we had meeting this special guest. And, you know, it was all this uh, in a sort of brochure copy. In 1987, the first sort of quasi behind the scenes book came out, a book written by Randy Bright with the assistance of Bruce Gordon or Imagineers. Um, called Disneyland Inside Story. And this actually did have some slight references to Yippee Day and pictures of things be backstage behind the scenes and a little peek, uh, you know, since it was pretending to be an inside story. But at the end of the day, it was written by Disney employees. It was edited by Disney editors. It was published through with, with the blessing of the Disney company. So it it again was really an official view of what Disneyland wanted you to think it was like to work at Disneyland. Um, and it's a, a nice book, but I mean, I could, <laughs> it, it certainly didn't go very deep at all, which is what was my idea is what, what's it really like to work there? It's, it's, I knew from my friends who work there that this is really a job. It's not, People don't skip to work and, you know, those smiles aren't always a thousand percent authentic. And while it seems on the surface as nothing ever went wrong, is that we all knew better. <laughs> is that is that it was a, a, a real place where sometimes things did go wrong and as hard as Disneyland tried and they usually did their best, always didn't guarantee that that odd, strange, unhappy things uh, happen. You take several, several years to write this book. Run me through that process. You're, you're not only doing, you know, journalistic process of thinking through things and, and making sure you have your sources correct, but you're also, as you're saying, going deep, you're, you're taking away the icing and really going to the cake of what the actual Disneyland experience is. Um, where did you even begin to collect information and interviews? How did that process start for you? Well, that was uh, the main reason why it took probably seven years to compile the information and write it was the fact that I wanted as many cast members' viewpoints and adventures reflected in it as possible. And another reason why I really early on knew, okay, I I really don't want to work at Disneyland because I don't want to write a book that's my adventures at Disneyland. You know, just one random guy who worked there for one summer you know, selling churros or whatever, you know, here's, here's what he thinks about Disneyland. I, I didn't have interest in doing that. I wanted an, a big view of what the common experience is and the uncommon experience when you work there long enough to see the weird things that can sometimes happen. So I was determined to interview and my goal was I've got to interview at least 200 people or else, you know, I really won't have the depth of stories um, that I want that reflect the full history and all the different nooks and crannies of, of official and especially unofficial Disneyland history. And I ended up interviewing about 220 or 230 people total for the mm. book. And uh, another another gift of being able to do that was that everybody had a couple stories about Disneyland. And, and some people had many, many, many stories at Disneyland. But when you interview over 200 people, you can really pick the best of the best of the best of those stories so that rather than, you know, okay, I, I talked to 30 people and here are all these stories. I was able to talk and gather, you know, literally a couple thousand stories and, you know, boil that down to the four or 500 best ones. But I, I started interviewing my friends from college and my friends' friends. Um, and then when I ran out of friends, friends, and friends, 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 I started looking anywhere I could to find names of people who worked at Disneyland. I, I quickly discovered that if they worked at Disneyland, they were much less likely to talk to this you know, 25 year old <laughs> kid who'd never been there. Um, nowadays, it's not uh, that big a deal for 
cast members to talk out of school, at least uh, anonymously or on social media. But back then in the in the eighties, if you weren't at Disneyland, you were part of this this holy secret society. It was, you know, you did not talk out of school and that, uh, you know, several people I contacted through the, I get names of people uh, who worked at Disneyland and I'd look them up in the phone book. And if they were in the phone book, I'd give them a call. And if they were still working there, um, some of them did talk to me, but, but just as often people would say, Oh, you know, uh, no, I can't talk about my job. What, what do you work there? No, do you work for the company? No, no, no. This is, this is top secret stuff we do here. You know, these are war secrets. We can't, you know, I can't share you any, any information about that. And those are people who wouldn't share their stories. So what I eventually did was found a, a large collection of old Disneyland line magazines and they had sections in the back called the golden ears. And when somebody retired from Disneyland, um, they would do, you know, Hank Feltz is, is just retired from Disneyland after 32 years. And so I'd see people who retired and those would be the people I'd start calling. And they would typically no longer with the company, obviously. So they'd be more willing to speak. And as well, they were typically uh, people who'd been there a long time, had seen everything and had, you know, stories about, about everything and anything. Perhaps the greatest uh, godsend to finding folks to interview was one fella who was in the Disneyland Alumni Club named, he was an officer in the club named Jim Barngrover. He was a trombonist, the original trombonist in the Disneyland band. And he had a directory of everyone who back in the mid eighties was a member of the Disneyland Alumni Club. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a copy of that directory and suddenly I had mailing addresses. I didn't have phone numbers, but I had mailing addresses and names of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who used to work at Disneyland and best of all, still loved it because they consciously maintained their connection to it through the Disneyland Alumni Club. So as many of those people as I could, I found phone numbers for, and so many of them were, were gracious and spoke to me. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty soon I had enough to do, uh, you know, supplemented by all these years of, of research through old newspaper articles and, uh, you know, lawsuit case filings and, you know, other, other research besides the interviews. But the interviews were really the basis of, of so much of the book. You, you mentioned the lawsuits and the case filings. And I think that's something, if people have not read your, your stuff, one of the more shocking elements, especially if you're very used to the candy-coated sort of, here's the history of Disneyland stories, is your books, you know, they they discuss accidents and even deaths that have occurred in the parks. Disney didn't necessarily take kindly to that, though, correct? It's been funny, the reaction from uh, from the Disney company toward my books has been when I when they heard I was working on my books. And they found out pretty early on after I started contacting um, people who were working at the park and they who were more than hourly. Mm -hmm. So when I started contacting people who were in lower and middle and even upper management, asking them if, if I could interview them, those were the people who not only said no, but a couple of them went to the company and said, hey, there's somebody poking around. So I started receiving um, letters and phone calls from Disney publicity and Disney legally, uh, a legal department encouraging me not to pursue this project. Uh, you know, telling me that I was not allowed to to write a book about Disneyland, uh, that I had no legal right to to write about Disneyland, and you know whatever they could to dissuade me. Um, to the point where it was finally like you know if, if you do this, we can't guarantee what'll happen. You know, sort of fake threats. Um, so I was a little nervous when the book was about to come out and, you know, made doubly sure there was, there was nothing in there that was uh, malicious and everything that was verifiable by fact. And certainly if it was some innocuous uh, anecdote about some silly thing a guest did or said, there was, there was no way to hundred percent authenticate that, but anything that, that could be authenticated that, that I did and that everything in the book was, was, written in a nice way from a, from a, from a heart that loves Disneyland. Um, and I put it out there and publicly I've never seen Disneyland, uh, bash any of my books or say anything bad about my books. And in fact, they rarely say 
anything about my books. And I, uh, I, I finally found out why. A couple months after Mouse Tales came out, I was talking to the former archivist, uh, the late Dave Smith, about my book. He had uh, purchased a copy the very first day it was out, <laughs> July 17th, 1994. Uh, he would bought a copy and then let me know how much he loved it. Um, asked me to send him a couple more copies at, as gifts. And as years would go on, he would occasionally buy copies to send people as Christmas presents and stuff because he just, he was tickled by it. He, he loved, he just really enjoyed the book and would say, this is nothing I would ever write about, but oh, what fun because there's <laughs> nothing else out there like this. And a couple of months after the book came out, there was an article came out in the LA Times about my, me and my book and, you know, the, the adventure and, and they called the Disney company to find out, you know, what do you think about this book? And, uh, is it true and whatnot? And the person they quoted was Dave Smith saying, I've heard of the book, but I've never read it. So, you know, I can't say if it's good or bad, basically. So the next time I saw Dave, who, and I'd seen him about two times a year at, uh, at this uh, Disney Anna show, that would take place in Garden Grove and later in Anaheim. I I saw him um, the following uh, winter and said, Dave, what is this quote? And I brought a copy of the newspaper article. What are you talking about? You've never read the book and you can't comment. And he goes, oh, that's the official Disney um, response that we're all instructed at corporate. We have to say that Mm -hmm. if anybody asks about your book, we have to. We can acknowledge that we've heard of it, but we have to say we haven't read it, so we can't say anything about it, and and leave as brief a quote as possible to move on to the to the next <laughs> subject. You know, change the subject because the official position of the Disney company now is not that you are the enemy, uh, you know, out to get us, but that you are the competition out to cost us money. In that if somebody goes to a bookstore and there's 10 books about Disneyland and nine of them are company approved histories that have, uh, you know, that we've published ourselves and they choose instead to buy your book, you just cost us 20 bucks. <laughs> so, so suddenly I was, you know, I was Universal Studios all of a sudden. It was like, oh, you know, I, that's a short sighted view to me is that I would think that people would read Mouse Tales and get so excited about about this this whole other level of looking at Disneyland that they'd be excited to visit it more often, to buy merchandise, maybe buy an annual pass. And in fact, over the years, I've heard from many, many, many people that have said that this is, you know, Mouse Tales was something that, you know, inspired them or, or, or really got them started or interested in, you know, their fanaticism about Disneyland for, for better or worse. Well, I I would have to sort of agree with that myself. I you know my first uh, foray into the whole Disney sort of history aspect of it was your book was Mouse Tales. It was in my high school library, and I picked it up oh on a whim, and uh, I read it once, and then I took it back, and then a week later I picked it back up and read it again. <laughs> so um, I'm now an AP here in Florida. So yeah, no, you gave them money. Yeah. I'll tell you that. I promise you that. Yeah. No, that's, a, <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. So you, you also discuss in uh, the preface for more Mouse Tales, the sequel, how the release of your first book garnered, as you said, you know, positive and negative reactions from people, the negatives from the company, I, I would understand, uh, and the positives from fans. But I, I imagine you also had some negatives from the fan community as well. It, it, it's something I didn't even think of. I, I was assuming if anybody was unhappy with it, it would be the company. And in fact, I did have a number of people at signings who, um, two people in particular, and, and one is actually written about in more mouth tales, <laughs> who came up to me and, and borderline accosted me, you know, with how, how dare I, how could I do this? You know, what are you, you know, uh, you know, you're all wrong. Everything, this is all filled with lies. You're, you're an evil person. I'm casting a hex on you. Um, you know, so that, that wasn't entirely surprising mean, to the level it was, was mm-hmm. surprising, but the fact that, that people were sticking up for their, you know, saw this as a threat to their job and they were sticking up for their company. Um, I sort of can see that, but it, it did surprise me. There were some fans who were so enmeshed in their, uh, adulation of the Disney company, you know, so completely, 
you know, glossed over uh, that they saw that as their job to come and give me a hard time about saying all these horrible things about Disneyland. And I would always say, well, what, what in it don't you like? And if they gave an example, it was like, well, that really happened to which their response was, Oh no, it didn't. Or no, it wasn't, didn't happen that way. Or, well, yeah, it happened, but you really shouldn't be writing about that, uh, which I didn't, you know, I'm, I, I just look at it as a different way to me. The more information I have about something the the more interesting it is to me. And if uh, it's not for everyone, I will admit that if you don't, want to <laughs> want to see Disneyland in living color and black and white. If you only want to see it in, you know, colorized, you know, maybe the realistic view is, is not for you. And that's, that's quite all right. So what led you to write that sequel? Did you just have, as you mentioned, you had tons and tons and tons of stories. Did you just have more you wanted to tell? It was mostly a, a clamoring by people who said, Hey, we want to read more stories. And I did, so many book signings and nowadays bookstores aren't the first place that most people think of to buy books. But back then that's where, where people did buy the majority of books were at Barnes and Noble or Walden books or B Dalton's or crown books. And so I would, every weekend I would do a book signing somewhere throughout Orange County and people would come and, and buy the book. Or if they'd already read it, they would, thank me and ask when's the next one coming <laughs> you know I'll, I'll buy another one if you write another one and as well so many cast members would come to these events and and slip me their number and say that was the, that was a fun book here call me when you're doing the next one i've got <laughs> you know three or four doozies you'd you'd love to include and then what what really pushed me over the top though in doing the sequel more mouse tales um because i i wasn't interested in in sort of doing a continuation of the first book and just here are a thousand more crazy stories. You know, you, that would be, I don't know if it would be repetitive because I mean, just to me, if it's a good Disneyland story, I could, I could read a thousand more of those, but as far as going to, to research that would probably not be quite as much fun. So I, I vowed to only do it if I could find, you know, there was an interesting story beyond just here are a bunch of more anecdotes and that story began unfolding before my eyes during those five years between the release of Mouse Tales and the release of more Mouse Tales. And that was, you know, Disneyland was changing to be a place that I and most of the people who worked there uh, who were, you know, old timers, you know, we didn't recognize it. It was, you know, it used to be the cleanest, safest, you know, uh, employee pleasing place to to work and to visit and disneyland was cutting corners to maximize profit and bad things happened and so as cast members came forward with their stories firsthand stories of things they they witnessed that were being done to to take the disney out of disneyland you know that's really what motivated the second book was to sort of hold disney accountable and knowing it wasn't too late that hopefully they could and would turn back to their ways of old. And I, I knew they wouldn't do an about face and say, yeah, we screwed up. We're going back to the days of Walt. And, you know, here the cast members are paid an obscene amount. And, you know, everybody's so happy holding hands uh, <laughs> to come to work and, and uh, everything, you know, you could you could eat your meal, which is affordably priced, right off of the sidewalk. You know, I knew we we're never getting back to those days, but at least we could get back to the days of five or ten years earlier when things were where this seemed to be a really good mix of it, it was a good place to work, but it still wasn't family. It was a wonderful place to visit, even though it was kind of expensive. It was it was clean and extremely safe, you know, these were all attainable goals to me. And that was, was my hope that hopefully uh, if I came out with this book saying uh, that starts out the first seven or so chapters about here, are these wonderful stories of, of visiting and working at Disneyland. And then the last couple stories where things get a little dark because things are starting to fall apart uh, due to negligence that hopefully, you know, other people would also pick up that baton and and let Disney know, hey, you've got to you've got to change the way you're doing. And I I take zero 
credit for for Disney eventually getting that message. But within a few years, um, they finally did get that message and cleaned up their act. And while it still has problems and it's not a perfect place to work, um, it is extremely, it's about as safe as it's ever been. Um, it's uh, extremely clean. It's uh, high quality entertainment that's highly themed and not, not as many, uh, you know, cheap little <laughs> fake entertainments, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the guest won. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit about another book that you wrote between the two Mouse Tail books, Mouse Under Glass, which was an examination of all Disney animated films from Snow White to Tarzan. Uh, what made you want to go in this direction? It's a, it's different than the parks. Why did animation also appeal to you? When I grew up, my, my two great loves were um, Disneyland and old movies, uh, Disney movies and old comedies and in fact, the first book I tried to write was actually a biography of the of the film comedian Danny Kay, but there was no interest in that. <laughs> Nobody wanted to read about that, but suddenly people wanted to read Disneyland, so that became my my first published book. But so after the first book, it's like, oh, people are buying this book; they have a great interest. Now I can write about my other my other passion, old movies. But I've got this built-in Disney-loving audience that I've met through through uh, conventions and, and shows and signings. Um, if I write about Disney, old Disney movies, it sort of uh, you know became a, a different subject while still in, serving to a great extent the same audience. Um, people let me know after that book came out that many people loved it, but the the one complaint I got was it was, this is a good book, but I'd sure like to know more about Disneyland. And it was just really... <laughs> to me was eye opening as that before doing uh, any research, any writing, any interviews about Disney, anything, my gut feeling, and I think probably the same gut feeling that many of the executives at Disney and Burbank had was that this was a company that all began with a mouse and that our most popular feature is Mickey Mouse. And beyond that, you know, animation and be greater than that, the movies and Disneyland and Disney World are a nice little side, you know, spin off of that. But, you know, they weren't as beloved as the, you know, the animated classics. And what I found out is just the opposite does seem to be true. And I don't know when this phenomena happened, but it seemed like because people could actually visit Disneyland and make it their own, is that this love switched and it became part of their personal stories and their memories and it became their Disneyland. Mickey Mouse was never my Disneyland, but you know people could say I grew up inside Disneyland, that's my Disneyland. They they took ownership of it and Disneyland and I'm sure Disney World have become personal to people in a way that that a movie um has a much harder time uh, achieving that that feeling and that passion. Well, and you mentioned, of course, Danny Kay, which uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. In 2012, you do take a break from Disney and you write the biography on, on Danny Kay, who, beyond being known for such films as Court Jester and White Christmas, also, of course, for Disney fans out there, hosted the 25th anniversary special for Disneyland and the Epcot opening special. What attracted you to Kay? Was it just your childhood love of his uh, films or w what interested you? Yeah, it, exactly right. That was, uh, you know, I just loved... Uh, old movie comedies uh, with the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy and Danny Kay was was one of my uh, you know top three favorites with with those other two groups. But uh, you know, so when I was in college, I knew I wanted to be writer, but I didn't know write about what. And I had uh, hung out with a bunch of fellows who were also old film buffs, and they had started writing books. And I thought, oh, I want to be a writer. They're writing books about old movies. Maybe I'll do that too. And nobody's ever written a book about. Danny Kay and his movies and, and records and TV shows. So I'll start doing that as sort of a project to learn how to write and research and interview while in college. And I spent the last three years of, of college driving into LA frequently and interviewing, you know, 85 year old, you know, <laughs> directors and writers and uh, actors and, and people who, who worked and knew Danny Kay. And then at the end of uh, college, I put together, you know, there was no intention to ever 
publish this or no assurance that it would ever be a real book. It was more like a writing project or a, a writing, uh, you know, lesson <laughs> for me. But uh, just for fun, I, I sent it to uh, some agents and, and they said, well, you know, that that looks like a nice idea for a book, but nobody wants to read about Danny Kay. He's, you know, he's, he's uh, almost 80 years old. He hasn't made a movie in years. So uh, find something more marketable and, and call me. So I put all my notes in a box and put it away in the garage uh, and turned to my other fascination, Disneyland, to start writing about that and quickly discovered that there was the, the fervor and interest and that even though no one else thought at that time to write books about Disneyland, that, that there really should be one. And that's how I got into Disneyland. And then after four books about Disney, uh, I did want a chance to recharge and write about something different. So I pulled all my notes out of out of the garage about Danny Kay, uh, interviewed everybody I could find who was still alive who worked with him that I hadn't gotten the first pass, and finally came out with that book called Danny Kay, King of Gestures, which is just one of my favorite projects. It does have uh, a little bit about Disney. As you mentioned, it's two big projects with Disney. I sort of wish it would have he would have worked with him more because his persona at that time was someone who worked so well uh, with children and just came off. So it just seemed to sync with the with the Disney vibe of that time so so well. He just seemed like he would just be the perfect performer. But after doing the Epcot grand opening special, he sort of burned bridges and and was not wanted back to work with Disney ever again. So speaking of Epcot, we'll talk about the 2007 release uh, of your East Coast book. Finally, we get to uh, talk about Florida, Reality Land, True Life Adventures of Walt Disney World. Uh, What relationship did did you have with Disney World at that time? And and when was your first visit to the East Coast Park? My first visit to to the East Coast Parks uh, came in, uh, would have been... 1994, right after the release of Mouse Tales, and I planned that trip after having people, you know, the initial reaction to Mouse Tales was, give us more, give us more crazy stories. So my thought before deciding to to write uh, Mouse Under Glass was that I would write sort of an East Coast version of Mouse Tales. So I went on my first trip in 1994, expecting it to just be Disneyland only with a you know a southern accent <laughs> and was shocked to discover that it was an entire city and that it was you know its similarities to Disneyland were seemingly coincidental because it just had a, a different vibe and even though some of the exact same rides were there the the whole purpose of it the the aura of it the cast members attitudes just everything was so so different. It was so large and so spread out. And as I started initially researching his history, I found out, A, this is a completely different type of story than I told before. And that just to do another collection of here's silly stories and here's, uh, uh, you know, uh, horrific accidents or tragedies or, you know, blackouts or hurricanes or, you know, whatever the the sensational news would be, no one has ever told this fascinating behind the scenes story of the creation of Walt Disney World before, except for the company uh, in their own special way, which really just scratches the surface. And so very early on, I got interested in doing that. But since it was so far away from my home in California, uh, I was only able to get out to Disney World uh, typically once a year for about a week at a time. So for primarily once a year, up until the I started focusing exclusively on Reality Land about 10 years later, I would take one trip for about a week out and interview as many people as I can and then fly home and basically interview nobody <laughs> or, or very few people until the next year where I'd go back and, and look for people and find people. And it was just a, a, it, it was a very difficult way to research and write a book like I was trying to do to interview a mass number of people, you know, three and four at a time and then nobody for a year. So it it did take a while to get going um, until after about uh, eight or nine years when I started focusing exclusively on reality land and then getting to know certain key people in the history of Disney world, 
who could then refer me to others and eventually uh, you know all the way up the chain to card walker which was uh you know uh, amazing <laughs> that i would get that high but uh i was able to talk uh, to the number one person all the way down to you know whoever you would <laughs> whoever would be on the other end of the spectrum to provide a full picture of what it was like to work there and especially what it was like to to create uh, uh such a unique incredible place. Now, I have to ask, because I, I feel like Cardwalker is this person that is uh, sort of with all these people full of color and verve and entertainment and excitement and, you know, like these big Walt Disney-esque characters, even people like Marty Sklar, you know, these sort of like creative people. You, ha you have people like Card who are very, 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 very important to the history of the parks, but people don't really know much about them. What what was your experience having the interactions with him? What what kind of personality was Mr. Walker? Card Walker, everything I heard about Card Walker, I, I interviewed Card uh, over the course of somewhere between five and ten minutes on a phone call. And in, in that short amount of time, I learned that everything I'd been told about him was confirmed 1,000%. <laughs> and that was that Card Walker was someone who was in charge all the time. He knew it. He had no patience for anything. He didn't have any time for a spare word, a spare adjective. Everything was functional, fast, expedient about him. And most to be able to be the top man at Disney and, and operate that way, he was an excellent delegator. He was very good at going, that's the man to do that, have him do that, have him do that, have him do that. And that's, uh, th that was the impression I was given of him. So I interviewed one of Roy Disney's right-hand men in finance and uh, uh, shortly before that. And I said, and I, my last question is always, anybody else you, sh you can suggest I should talk to? And, and this fellow, his name is Dick Morrow. His suggestion was, yeah, you should talk to Card Walker. And I just sort of laughed, like, yeah, I should talk to Card Walker. And he goes, yeah. And he pulled out his, his personal phone book and he goes, here's his number, 818-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Call him. Tell him Dick Morrow to call him. So I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so the, I got home and, and called Card Walker's personal phone number and the uh, answer machine came on and I left a message that what I was doing and and then um, didn't hear anything for about a month. And then all of a sudden at my office, I got a phone call and picking up the phone. And, uh, David, this is Card. And I was silent for a minute and said, Card who? <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I mean, when I left that message for Card Walker, I thought the number, the chance of him calling me back was somewhere between zero and none. So Card Walker, you know, how can I help you? <laughs> And the whole thing was me uh, asking questions and him qu answering in three or four word sentences, which typically included telling me exactly who would be the best person to answer mm -hmm. that question. None of those people, the answer to none of those questions was Card Walker. <laughs> the best person to answer that question was always somebody else. Typically it was Dick Nunes, but there were a couple other people who said, no, no, this is, you talk to him on this and you talk to him on this. What else do you need to know? And then when I, in five or 10 minutes, I'd run through my 15 questions. I'd gotten no stories and no actual answers, but I'd gotten some extremely valuable <laughs> referrals and I got to talk to Card Walker. <laughs> and after that conversation, I knew, okay, that is, oh my gosh, that's, that's how he ran the Disney company is how he ran our uh, five or 10 minute phone call. So a few years, uh, of course, after the Danny Kay book, you also write, uh, you, you write your Let's see here. This would be your fifth. Well, I, I guess the cartoon book is technically not counted. So your fourth book on Disneyland and uh, or D the Disney parks, I should say. And uh, this one, of course, deals for people who don't know the people v. Disneyland uh, heads back to California and gets into the legal weeds of those attempting to sort of sue the park and basically the system in place that gives Disneyland that sort of, I guess, legal edge would be the best way to put it. Were you always fascinated by that sort of courtroom drama aspect and, and weren't able to find ways to always put it in the books? Or what led you to decide this is an entire book onto itself? Well, two things did. And the, and the first was that 
the law, the, one of the chapters in the original Mouse Tales was about lawsuits. And we'll go the chapter is called Lawsuit Land, and it's about all the, not all, but many of the, the most sensational cases that were filed against Disneyland over the years. And that was always one of my uh, favorite parts of the book because they were typically, um, the court papers would provide a lot of deep background and interesting stories about these cases. Some of them were, were made up of whole cloth, you know, they were complete nonsense of, of people making things up to, to take advantage of the Disney company. But most of them involved, you know, real verifiable events that happened, um, including, you know, all this or, or most of the sensational uh, deaths at Disneyland and typically resulted in a lawsuit. Um, so it was, it was one of those intriguing parts of the first book, but, what made me decide to write an entire book about it was that after more mouse tales came out in 1999, I went on to, as you mentioned, uh, a few other projects. And then after um, Danny Kay came out in 2012, I said, okay, it's time to write about Disney. It's been 13 years since I actively wrote about Disneyland in book form is there a story at Disneyland? Again, I didn't want to just do another collection of here's even really much more mouse tales. I didn't want to do that with, you know, hundreds of more uh, anecdotes. I, I wanted to pin it on a story. There needed to be a story. So just as in mouse tales was the foundation of the, the beginning and the, the early history of Disneyland up to then current day, and more mouse tales bridge the gap of how Disneyland had changed in the interim between the release of the two books. I looked back and, and said, okay, over the last 10, 15 years, you know, since the release of that last book, what's been the story of Disneyland? What's been the most important impacts on the park? And it was without a doubt the impact of lawsuits and lawyers on Disneyland. It had uh, their pervasiveness uh, and, and having the threat of a lawsuit hanging over their heads had changed it so that whereas before uh, when Disneyland first opened, it was the creative people in charge. And then later on, it became the money people and the uh, marketing people became in charge. Now it was the lawyers in charge and and almost every change of any significance that was made at Disneyland over those past 10 years was a direct result over somebody suing Disneyland over something um, or the lawyers thinking, you know what, conceivably somebody could trip on that or climb up on that or, you know, whatever, looking five steps ahead on somebody could uh, make a claim about, they started just bulldozing sections of the park and great many policies, procedures, signs, and a cha so many changes in so many ways just to, to uh, settle claims from a lawsuit or to avoid uh, liability in the future. So finishing up here, uh, I want to talk about two projects that you are uh, currently a part of. Uh, one is that you also help beyond writing. You, you help other people uh, sort of get their stories out. Uh, and one of those is A Walk in the Park with Bob D'Arcy, who was the first uh, host for Disneyland. Uh, when did you get to know Bob? And, and what sort of enjoyment do you get of helping others kind of get their stories told? Yeah, I, I loved working with Bob, and and uh, and the reason I agreed to help him with his book was that a couple years before I'd helped a fellow named Bob Penfield, who was the last original opening day employee at Disneyland to retire from Disneyland. I helped him uh, get his book out, and so I was, and it was just such a great experience. Because I know if I I wouldn't have pushed him, he he may not have have ever. You know, put in the hard work to, to not only write a book, but to do one as fabulous as he did. Uh, and it was just a great experience. And so in working on uh, uh, my latest project for myself, when I found Bob D'Arcy, he mentioned that he had written his own book, but didn't know what to do with it. You know, he, he tried to publish it through Disney and Disney was sort of stringing him along so what would I advise? And so I tried to give him some uh, some tips on, on strengthening the book, uh, as well as uh, opportunities of where 
it might be published. And we ended up just, uh, he was such a wonderful person to work with that it ended up uh, us two working together to bring it out. And his book, A Walk on the Park, is just, uh, it's tremendous. It's very on Disney like <laughs> in in a number of ways because it's it's uh, just like Bob Penfield's book it's their they're just it's their personal story and it's not a a sugar coated thing so there are some sad and unhappy things in it um there's some happy and joyous uh episodes in it and there's just some incredible uh behind the scenes history that people, you know, before Bob surfaced in the, in the mainstream now that, you know, you would have, you would have never known. And in fact, that even Disney's official tour guide program, they had no idea about Bob. He'd been sort of expunged and, and forgotten from history to the point where in the tour guide office, they have a big display on the wall, you know, and they had, they had the wrong people up there, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as the first tour guide, it was Bob. It wasn't, so they had to remake their wall to get a picture of Bob up on up on the wall. So uh, it was a great experience because Bob has just uh, he's become a good friend, and he's uh, you know he loved his time at Disneyland and went on to become uh, uh, a successful uh, actor and uh, just just a great guy. I'm I'm so happy he was able to, his book is to come out so people can can learn about him and meet him through his book. So let's talk about your newest book, uh, The 55ers, The Pioneers Who Settled Disneyland. Tell us a little bit about this project. It's different than the other ones that you have done in the past. Oh, yes, completely. I accept that it's about Disneyland, but <laughs> the, that makes it kind of similar. But but in some ways, it's it's very, very different. Um, and that's how I met uh, uh, Bob D'Arcy was I had the idea back in 2004 is where the idea for the 55ers book came from and that was that we were nearing the 50th anniversary of Disneyland and I noticed that that Disney was very good at promoting its primarily its animators and beyond that its uh, imagineers and its uh, filmmakers but never really celebrated its cast members the people who 9 to 5 or whatever <laughs> schedule they got you know worked at the regular jobs or irregular jobs at Disneyland, the, the guest contact people, the people who made the magic happen on a daily basis, it sort of, I don't know if Disney looked down on them, but they, they certainly didn't see them as special. And in fact, you know, it, it struck me at the time, well, you know what, maybe I don't see them as, as special as they really are either, because while I interviewed a couple dozen of these original cast members, for mouse tales, uh, what I do is is pull out their their most wild stories to include in the book. But all the things about them and what it was like for them to work at Disneyland, personal information to their experiences on opening day or meeting Walt or what they did before or after their time at Disneyland, I I sort of neglected that information. So I thought, oh, this would be an interesting book. It would be who were these people who opened Disneyland? But due to the time, you know, there just wasn't time to do an adequate job uh, before the 50th anniversary opened. So I encouraged Bob Penfield, who had become a friend, to do that book, to write. He was, um, as the last original Disneylander, was the person who seemed to be in the middle of everything. He's, you know, every friend group has the one person who keeps the friends <laughs> together, the one who's always the person who calls, who is the one who always sets up the reunions or the parties, the one who's always checking in and saying, uh, or sending out emails and you know, who, who, the glue of a group. And that was Bob. He knew everyone he worked with over the years. He kept in touch with as many of them as, as possible a group he was a founding member and helped organize called Club 55, made up of um, most of the employees who were working directly for Disney in the beginning and stayed on for at least 15 years. He was an integral to that. Um, so I thought Bob should write this book. So I, I kept encouraging him to write a book um, and uh, eventually convinced him to do it, but it turned out to be his own story. And so I sort of split off from that project to do the story myself of who were all the employees who worked at Disneyland, not just the official club 55 members, you know, everybody who, 
who work there, even if they only work there. And in, in one case, I interviewed a, a man who worked at Disneyland in his opening year, worked there for three days, but he was, he was there in the beginning and, <laughs> and, uh, I thought Disneyland was kind of silly and would never work. So he wanted to get a job that would be more reliable. You know, so I tried to find everyone who were these people and, uh, you know, what was their story. And over the years compiled more and more information, uh, specifically uh, or intensively over the last three to four years, you know, trying to find everybody who was still around, who who uh, was there in the beginning, um, and those who had passed to find their widow or their children or their grandchildren, anybody who could share stories on who these people were. Um, and and the most fascinating thing to discover, and it was confirmed each day as I interviewed new people, was how nowadays Disneyland is a place where you go and there's a fella dressed up as a cowboy and, but you know, it's a cast member who's dressed up as a cowboy and you know, he's a, he's a cast member cause he's got a cell phone <laughs> and he goes, Oh yeah, the bathroom's over there. And you know, and, and it's a, a lot of performers dressed up as in scene back when Disneyland first opened most of those cast members were really what they were pretending to be. Walt Disney wanted Disneyland to be and feel as authentic as possible. So when in his Indian village, those were all authentic, full-blooded Native Americans, uh, many of them, you know, who, who were born and grew up on, on reservations throughout the West, working in the Indian village, the cowboys who drove the stagecoaches and, and rode the horses and the, and the pack mules, those were all experienced horse wranglers, you know, who had, who had come from, you know, riding herd or, or later many of them would go and get jobs in Hollywood as, as stuntmen or as actors in Western movies, but they were experienced horsemen who had always made their living in, that way. The people who operated the shops on Main Street, all those stores, n- none of them were run by Disney. They were all operated by independent shopkeepers who selected their own merchandise, and the merchandise was themed to whatever their store in the land was. Um, and they picked it out, they priced it, you know, whether it was a belt buckle that had nothing to do with Disneyland or whether it was an ashtray that they put a little uh, pixie on it and pretended that's kind of like <laughs> Tinkerbell or, you know, whatever they could do. It was all independent mom and pop shops. And and everything throughout Disneyland was filled with these fascinating people, all the vaudevillians who, who worked at the Golden Horseshoe Saloon. It was just, just such an incredible group of people to get to to learn about most of them uh, who people have, have never heard about. These are people that, you know, a handful of them Disney will, will talk about certainly uh, Wally Bogue and, and uh, you know, maybe some of the the better known uh, Disney employees like uh, Dick Nunes, people have probably heard of, and maybe even Tommy Walker and, and some of the others, but, uh, you know, 99% of these people were people that Disney has never written about, and they have just the most amazing stories. And, and what's been extra gratifying, and uh, I was so blessed that uh, that many of the folks I interviewed opened their personal photo albums to me so that I could run their own photographs and turn this into not just a book, but a giant coffee table book on beautiful, glossy paper with, you know, their personal photos. So most of these photos in the book, people have never seen uh, before and, and certainly have never been published any anywhere before. And, uh, you know, the first uh, sort of quasi makeshift uh, wardrobe building that was, you know, built out of, you know, sheets of plywood <laughs> and, and shoved against a, a, a tin warehouse barn. You know, I got a picture of the the ladies the first ticket seller getting ready inside that and you know the pictures inside the Sunnyview jams and jellies uh, store provided by the daughter of the the fellow who managed that in its first years and and a picture of inside the the, the uh, plantation house chicken restaurant which I'd never seen before you know with one of the, the employees a picture of of him uh, you know having lunch with Fess Parker so it's uh it's just been an 
eye-opening experience putting this together. And I'm just so excited to be able to, to share it with people who, who I think often think, you know, basically all the stories about Disneyland have been told. And that to me, it was so gratifying to put this book together and show, no, we're not even close. <laughs> there, there are thousands of more amazing, important stories uh, left to be told. Now, when will the 55ers be out for people to get their hands on? Sometime during the month of September, mid to late September. Uh, exact date hasn't been set yet, but it'll go on sale to the general public. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to what people think. David Caning, I cannot thank you enough, not only for coming on the podcast, but truly, there would not be a podcast if it hadn't been for your first book. So thank you from the bottom of this <laughs> Disney nerd's heart. I really appreciate you for being on the show. Thank you, Nathan, so much. And that's it for this episode of Dream Finders. I'd like to thank David for being my guest, and you can buy all his books on his publisher's website, bonadventurepress.com. It's B-O-N adventurepress.com. Or you can also pick them up on Amazon. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com. Dreamfinders is hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Tell your friends about the show and please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It sure helps a lot. Also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. Dreamfinders is sponsored by Never Grow Up Vacations, the official travel partner of wdwnt.com. Never Grow Up Vacations specializes in trips to Disney destinations around the world. So be like us and never grow up. Head over to NeverGrowUpVacations.com to book your next trip today.